The First Million Words, Episode 1, an interview with Brian Thomas Schmidt. I can ever give to you up and coming writers is do not throw cans of condensed milk at your editors. Now, <laughs> I know there are times when um, it may offend you with their red pens, but I'm telling you right out, throwing cans of condensed milk is not a good solution. Just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Wow. That's 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 that's, that's profound stuff. Took me well, years, might... years years of professional work <laughs> to uh, come up with that advice for you, but. Uh, I learned that after many years. Well, yeah, I mean, you can do the whole multi-editor thing. Like, if you don't like, if you go to the doctor, you don't like what they have to say. You go to the next one to get a second opinion. I don't know. Is it good to have multiple editors, or uh, <laughs> just well, you know, well, just to get everything? Interesting that we talk on a serious note, talking about editing. Um, I do a lot of editing now for people, and between the anthologies that I've edited and um, books that I'm editing now for people. Uh, you know, the thing about editors that's so tough is, uh, when you, I don't think you realize how much editors want you to be good until you edit yourself. Hmm. Because, like, the slush that you have to read through, there's so much crap out there. I, 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 I know there were times when I sent stuff out that wasn't ready. But I don't think my stuff was ever quite this bad and that I've sent out. I think I, I had enough common sense to not send it out. There are people who literally think that every word they put on paper is genius. You mean that's, and, that's not the case? Oh, I mean, there's some stuff that you're just like, oh my god, I would never want anybody who's serious to see this and associate it with my name. So I was willing to put in more effort working with my authors than probably somebody else would have put in because I said, well, at least this is workable. At least we can fix it. I got a lot of first first story sales came through my anthology because of that. But I took the time to work with them and edit at a level that a lot of people would not because I had the choice because I didn't have enough competition for their work that I had to just blow it up and say I can't publish this. I mean, I was a first-time editor. I'm editing, editing the book. It's part of a series of anthologies. Mike Resnick is my headliner. It comes out, oh. it's out actually, it comes out April 18th. April 18th, okay. Yeah. I, I think we'll have this, we, we should have this up before then. Yeah, your story needs to be 90% there. I was, I was doing an editing class with Cat Rambo. Cat Rambo used to edit Fantasy Magazine. Mm-hmm. But stuff had to be there. 90% there. And if it wasn't 90% there, then it didn't get past slush. Mm-hmm. And I think the problem is most people are like, well, my story's 90% there. It doesn't do that much work. But probably the 90% she's talking about is the plot works, the character arcs work, and, you know, there's no typos. It's tight. It's concise. You know, all the notes are just fine-tuning. That's what 90% ready is at that point. Mm-hmm. Just some fine-tuning. Oh, this is a little bit unclear here. This character motivation in this one spot seems a little bit at odds with its earlier motivation. Can you clarify that? That kind of notes. That's what. That's when they might be willing to accept your story. But there's a lot of people who are like, oh, they'll, they'll work with me to fix it to make it better. <laughs> they just can't. It's not because they don't care, because no editor wants to find a crappy story. We want to find good stories. Yeah. We want to discover the next great writer. We want to have that re- relationship where it's like, okay... I helped launch, you know, Benjamin Love's career, and, uh, you know, uh, and as a result of that sale, he escaped from a life of having condensed milk thrown in his head. (laughs) So, you know, uh, he now owes me for the rest of my life, and whenever I need a story, I can totally get him to do one for me. They would rather have that relationship. All joking aside, they would rather have that than be the bad guy. Yeah. Now, now where, um, where would one go... To make sure that their story or, or book or whatever is up to that ninety percent before submitting. 
Well, look. Everybody writes crap. All of us have bad days. There, as you learn craft and as you internalize craft, the things that I, the things that really were hard for me on the worker prints were easier. Some, many of those things were easier for me on the returning. Mm -hmm. There are things that I just did instinctually that are now part of my arsenal when I write that I didn't even have to think about that were an entire draft by themselves of the worker prints to make them work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is part of our learning process. So if you want to get to that point, you're going to have to basically, you need to have some people that you can trust to beta read. And the best way to do it is probably get involved in a writer's group, an online critique group, or something like that. Or you're going to have to pay an editor who's willing to work with you to help you develop. There are developmental editors that will work with you. That will. I do developmental editing too, but, you know, uh, if, if I have to do that, you know, a lot of notes, I'm just going to tell you, you know, you're not ready yet. you got a lot of work here. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a client I edited for recently, and, 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 and um, English wasn't her first language. And I was like, you know what? It's not that you're not talented. You obviously have a gift, but you're not there with your craft. And I said, it's, it's not ready. And it's not going to be ready in your next draft. I said, literally, I'm at the point where I'm making the level of notes that I'm almost rewriting this thing. And if I really rewrote it to the level it needs it, I'd be ghostwriting the thing. Or yeah. co-writing the thing. And I said, so, you need a lot of work on it. And she, it was hard for her, but she was glad... Because her problem was she was using a lot of friends and family who didn't want to hurt her feelings. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say it's always best not to have, like, you know, you know your your best friend read it. Because they're, they're not yeah. going to say, oh, hey, look, this, this part sucks. No, they're going to say, oh, I thought it was good. You know, it's, it's hard, unless your wife is a fellow writer and editor who's trying to get to the same professional level, like... Rebecca Moista and uh, Kevin J. Anderson or mm -hmm. Christy Catherine Rush and Dean Wesley Smith, they criticize each other's work harshly and they're still married because they're both in the same boat. Both sides of those couples are professional writers. They know they need that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, Ben, your wife is not going to be like, oh, um, no, this is a piece of crap, you're not there. Oh, uh, She's not going to say that to you because, <laughs> because she wants to stay married to you. Now, at the point when she does start saying that, you need to worry about your marriage. But uh, uh oh, she's oh uh oh <laughs> yeah no I've I oh she's she's well she she's a she's a big reader she reads a lot so I'll show her a story or something and she's like you know I I don't get this part here but it was pretty good you know so right. there, there's a little bit of encouragement but mostly like you know I don't get this part well that's good then you're lucky yeah. because I mean the 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 pro the problem is most people can't handle that telling you the truth. I don't like hurting your feelings either, but you're paying me, like, you know, my editing fee, $2 a page or whatever it is. Uh, that's my current rate, but that's pretty standard. But you're, you're, that's for um, line edits. Uh, developmental editing, I usually cut people a break. I mean, to develop a, for you, for a 90,000 word novel, you're going to pay me about 800 bucks if you're paying $2 a page. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm doing a developmental edit, you're going to pay me 250 to 300 because I'm, I'm basically reading it and then giving you notes on what I've read. Yeah, um, it's a lot different than line editing. Line editing, I have to read it two or three times because I've got to do the developmental edit, but then I've also got to do the, you know, do the whole line edits and copy edits and every, every other note on it too. Yeah. So it's a lot more work. The the reality of it is, if you're paying me, I don't feel ethically good about myself if I don't tell you that you're wasting your money. Like, you know, I've had clients where I've said, "Look, you're not ready for me to edit this yet, and it is wasting my time." and your money for me to edit it, because I'm basically editing every word. If that's if it needs that much editing, you're just not there yet. Yeah. You know? I mean, my novel, the latest novel, um, The Returning, it got copy edited, and it probably had maybe, it's 100, and, well, the manuscript was about 400 pages. Mm -hmm. There were probably 20 pages in that whole manuscript that didn't have a single mark on them. But if literally... Your page is more red than black when you get the <laughs> edits back, you're, you're, and then you're talking to every page. That's a problem. Yeah, That's probably not ready yet. The hardest part about it is you're, you're a writer. You're passionate. You're not patient. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're fired up about it, and it feels good to finish the story. You finish writing the story. You have done something that a lot of people never do. You finished it. Ex That's yeah, a huge big deal. But that's why people tell you to then put it aside for two months and bury yourself in another project. I, with, with the returning, 
the returning is book two of Davi Re. You know, we, we, when I was on your radio show, we talked about the first book, mm-hmm. Work of Prince, which was my debut novel. When I was writing The Returning, my marriage was falling apart. My now ex is mentally ill, and I had to put her in the hospital against her will a number of times during that whole period. Mm-hmm. And I had to deal with, um, you know, being told I was the worst person ever and cursed out and threatened and all these horrible things that people who are mentally ill do that they don't know what they're doing, okay? Uh, this was not the person, this was not the real her. This was a person who needed help. Mm-hmm. But I had to, because I loved her, I had to put her in the hospital and get her help. But I'm trying to write in the middle of that. And there were literally weeks where I didn't touch it. Once you read it, you'll see I wrote a very complex story. Mm-hmm. So when I got done with the thing, and, it, and I'm sending it to beta readers a chapter at a time, I don't look at their notes because I'm so afraid that it will throw me off my process because I figured that um, that where I was in the process was not at the point where um, I, I, it was going to be any good because of all the crap going on in my life. Mm-hmm. So when I got it done, I didn't finish it until I moved. I, you know, she was in the hospital. She ended up insisting on a divorce. She was never totally back to normal. So we got divorced. You know, my whole life fell apart. And I ended up moving back to Kansas to start over. Mm-hmm. I didn't finish the book until I moved to Kansas. And that was interesting. I put it aside. I finally picked it up again after I moved, looked at the beta reader's notes, and went back through it, and it wasn't so bad. It was not near as bad as I thought it was. The level of complexity in this novel is way more complex than the work of Prince. It's way more mm-hmm. complex. I've got, like, 17 point-of-view characters. Wow. I've got like nine or ten intercrossing uh, uh, plot lines. Um, it is written a bit like a born supremacy, born a born movie, uh-huh. with its with its thriller pacing. There's just when you come up for breath, something big happens that just totally throws the story in a new direction. Oh, that's... It, it, it it so it's extremely fast paced. That's nice. I, I, yeah. I like stories that do that. That just you know, like you can't put them down. That that you, you right. lose and sleep over are, them. Yeah. Stakes are really high, but that's the kind of story I put together. And so there's a lot of complex because it's written like a thriller mystery where things unfold and there's all these complications and things and you think it means something, but it means something. So, I mean, the fact that it was even decent blows my mind because I wrote in such entire chaos. Yeah. But, you know, putting it aside for two months and coming back to it gave me the perspective I needed. So I think that's something that's always been hard for me, but I will do that from now on with anything. It's hard because you want it, you get it done. You want like, I want to get it out there and get my million bucks and be the famous novelist, man. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I mean, that's where we all are. Let's be honest with ourselves. That's what really where we are. Oh yeah. yeah. But you know, the people who really sold those novels and got there are people who who took the time to set it aside and make sure it was ready before they sent it out. There have been writers who decided at some point in their career they were so successful they didn't need an editor. Well, yeah, Stephen King did that, right? Stephen King, Tom Clancy, and Rice are the three that come to mind. Yeah. Okay? All of a sudden, their sales dropped off yeah. because their book sucked. Yeah. They didn't have an editor. And they still sold a certain amount of books because they had fans that would buy whatever they put out there and they had their name on oh, it. Yeah, yeah. But people who were a bit more discerning about it were like, ah, oh, no, this isn't any good. And then they lost some readership and had to build it back up again. That was a mistake. So... There is value in that process, but I think it's really hard to be patient because you're so passionate. Yeah, I, I actually have, sometimes I feel um, because of being impatient about something, I'll, I'll kind of leave a story like halfway done. Like uh, uh, I'll get into a book and I'll think like, oh man, yeah, the ending is going to be so cool. But then, you know, that's a lot of words to get to the ending if, if it's like, at least 50,000 or 75,000, however many words your book is going to be. Sometimes I just kind of, in the middle, I'll lose that steam. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm like, you know, the ending is really far off and it's going to be a lot of work, you know. So, like, do you think putting it aside like that um, helps also just to finish? Well, can you hear my dog jingling? I I, I hear that, yeah. dog is... (laughs) It's not me, really. I swear to God. Yeah, this guy said, oh, he's, this is this guy. He's wearing a collar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a, yeah, that's actually advice I got from Guillermo, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> anyway, uh, no. <laughs> actually, to answer your answer your question, yes and no. Mm-hmm. If you put it aside, there's a tendency to not want to get back to it. 
However, part of my methodology that has developed for me is I don't write the last chapter in the first draft. I write everything but the last chapter. Okay, would you say I definitely have a complex plot? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, well, it's complex and it's it's big, too. You know, it's like the kind of the... It's epic and there's lots of pieces that fit together. Yeah, I was just going to say it's like the sci-fi equivalent of epic fantasy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's space opera. That's what yeah, it is. exactly. I mean, it really is. Space opera and epic fantasy are the subgenres that are really most related to each other between fantasy and science fiction. Mm-hmm. So, because of that, I can't really write the ending until all the pieces are in place. Because because it's I've got to wrap it up and tie up all the loose ends, so to speak. Yeah. So, I have, with, with the returning and with Sandman, the epic fantasy, which I'm now revising... And trying to get ready to go out on market. Mm. I never wrote the ending for that very reason. And it works for me. It drives my beta readers nuts. But <laughs> part of the reason that I didn't give my beta readers the ending until just now for the returning is because there's like a major cliffhanger ending that I didn't want anybody to talk about. Mm-hmm. So that was part of the reason I didn't give it to them anyway. Even though I wrote the chapter, I finished it in December. I just now in March finished the copy edits, and gave them the actual final chapter and said, okay, now you can see how it is. Wow. It sounds weird, but, I mean, for it to have the emotional impact that you want it to have, you've got to actually have the readers care about the character. Yeah, yeah, because other, otherwise they're just, you know, reading stories about strangers. So you, ha- you as writers have to work harder with your audience to connect them emotionally to the characters, to let them feel the emotions that the characters have for each other, so if some harm comes to somebody, they actually get it. Right, and they're not just in the, and they're not just like teenagers in a slasher flick. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there are things like that that uh, that I have had to do, you know. And part of it is is so I guess this is a long answer to your question. It's good and bad to let it go. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes you have to put it aside. My method for dealing with writer's block is that I have multiple things going on at one time. That's yeah. That's you know, like I said, that that is kind of a problem I have is. Is finishing? Yeah. So you never finish anything. Yeah. Well, except. Uh, well, you know, I've done. The, I've done uh, a couple handfuls of short stories, but. Uh, I mean, you couldn't even house train a dog before you gave it away to your brother-in-law. You don't finish. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was on purpose. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Part of my evil plot. But, but that uh, dog. That dog could have been trained. To lick Guillermo instead of himself, and you didn't even finish the job. So I mean, that's the problem. <laughs> or lick Guillermo after himself. Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, I know what I'm doing. Clean, now I can lick you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. It's like, Guillermo, why do you keep getting pink eye? Uh. <laughs> Guillermo, you smell like dog breath, man. What kind of clone are you? <laughs> <laughs> the ode to dog. But uh, I had a shower today. I it's I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, uh, I, I, you know you, you finishing is important. It really is. And if you have that problem, you really need to push yourself to finish. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I, I've taken um, the book that I'm closest to finishing is the one that uh, Guillermo and I are doing together. So I figure if that one's the closest to being done, that's the one I'm going to finish. Like put all my effort into and finish, and then come back to the other stuff. And that's smart, and that's what I'm doing too. You know, I have a lot of projects that I want to do. I've got other projects like my epic fantasy, which I never wrote the ending for, but the draft was done. You know, I have 22 chapters done. It's a 450-page manuscript. You know, I was like, okay, I'm going to go back and rewrite draft two of this before I do anything else, because mm-hmm. as much as I want to write something else, I need to finish this. Yeah. And I'm trying to be a professional. I need to get as many manuscripts in that professional condition as I can, and get them out there to publishers and start trying to sell them. So, why waste my time getting yet another partial draft when I can finish one that I've already got that's close? Now, when you when you say finished, you know, I, I mean, do you have a certain number of drafts that you have to, you know, like mentally, like, think, you know, oh, well, I have four drafts never, of this, so it's finished this now? This one has never been beta read. Uh, with, with returning, I went ahead and let beta readers work on my first draft. Normally, you probably wouldn't want to waste your time on beta readers until you have at least a couple drafts under your belt. Um, okay. Make sure you clean it up. Make sure you've caught a lot of things. Because once you burn off your beta readers, you can't really send them in again. Yeah. I mean, you can, 
but they're never going to have that fresh perspective that you really need. Now, um, there there are also quite a few in the worker prints. Um, there, you know, there are quite a few uh, viewpoint shifts in that. I, I wonder before worker prints, um, how many or was that like your first uh, novel that, that my, you did? My or? second novel. Second novel. First okay. novel was a romantic um, love story novel that. I will at some point finish, but um, uh, it's not ne- nearly ready to be consumed by anybody. Yeah, I gotta say it's 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 you know putting multiple viewpoints into one story. That's that's tough. You know, I, I, I that that took probably out of the things I've you know tried working on. That that's the one that's required the most time and effort is you know juggling all these viewpoints within one story. With a novel where, like, Worker Prince was 89,000 words. The mm-hmm. Returning, book two, is 107,000 words. Okay, it's like 16,000 words more. Mm-hmm. Now, some of my point of view characters only have one or two scenes in their point of view. And there are other characters who have, you know, point of view scenes in every chapter. Like mm-hmm. Davi Ree. Davi Ree's got a point of view scene, at yeah. least one point of view scene in every chapter. He often has two. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, the way you determine who the best person to tell the point of view is is, you know, who has the most to lose, the most at stake in this scene. For example, there's a, a fight between Davi and Taylor at one point where they're going through some rocky stuff in their romantic relationship. Mm-hmm. And I told it through the point of view of a character named Bordox. Bordox is, you know him from Worker Prince, but he's an antagonist. He's... Yeah. Davi's rival, and he just hates Davi, okay? And he is stalking Davi because he wants to get revenge. But by telling the point of view of that fight for him oversee, you know, overhearing it, I got a lot of drama from his anger and his, you know, him being there that they don't even know he's there. Mm-hmm. And him discovering that Davi has somebody he cares about that, you know, Bordox could take out his revenge. He doesn't have to take out his revenge on Davi. He might take out his revenge on Taylor. Mm-hmm. And basically, not only did I advance the Davi Taylor storyline, but the Bordox Davi storyline got advanced. So, see, I did a lot, number of things in one scene because I made that choice. Yeah, and you, you know, also, I, I think probably one of my favorite <laughs> little, well, I don't want to call it a trick, but, you know, my favorite little thing. Um, to kind of pepper into a story is where the viewpoint shifts uh, within one chapter, but they're kind of... Uh, like, there was that one scene where, where, where Bordox was chasing uh, Davi through the, the, the woods, and, you know, he finally like, discovered him. Right. And it switches back and forth between, you know, Davi is up front, and he doesn't even know that Bordox is behind him, and then Bordox is like, oh, I'm tracking him, but then he disappears. And, you know, I loved the... Um, you know, the tension that that creates. Right. Well, and I think, you know, and <clears throat> part of that is having already established their point of views earlier in the story. Yeah. Because we know the passion that they have. Yeah. So then by the time we get to those chase scenes, we know the level of tension that's in Bordox. So I contrast it with Davi, who Davi's just out there, he's relaxed, he's training his pilots. He's feeling very peaceful. Nobody knows where he is. And his life is very calm. And his pilots are doing better. And he's finally feeling like he's starting to succeed. It's a totally different level of tension from what Bordox has. Mm -hmm. Which is why that works. Because Bordox is like bloodthirsty, angry. And Davi's just all... (laughs) He's like having small talk. But Davi doesn't know it. See, that's why the tension works. But the other thing you'll notice is in those scenes, the point of view scenes are much shorter. Yeah, they are. The point of view scenes get shorter because I'm going back and forth between them. We're just like like cuts in a movie in a chase scene. Mm-hmm. You cut back and forth between the person who's uh, chasing the person and the person who's being chased. You know, uh, you, you have to kind of figure out what the, that pace is going to be. You can't start out your book with those short vignettes very well because people don't know anybody yet they're not invested in the characters mm-hmm. later on you could do that because <coughs> the character development's already happened that sets it up mm-hmm. uh but the decisions that you know the, the trickiest part of doing 
point of views is the transitions. Being able to transition between the point of view so you know that you switch point of view and so that it feels smooth is tricky. But I think what you'll find is, even though you're telling me that it's hard for you to do the multiple point of views, you'll find that I think it's actually, for me, it's harder to write with one point of view. I'm going to be doing it uh, with some stuff I've got coming up. Mm -hmm. But there's stuff that your character won't know. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you're telling it all, you know, I'm writing uh, The Adventures of Guillermo. Okay? And my character, Guillermo Velez, does not know some of the things that the rest of the characters know. And sometimes that can up the tension, but sometimes it also frustrates you because there's things the reader needs to know that you, you don't have any way to tell them. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell the reader those things because the character won't know it. You cannot tell them anything that that point of view character doesn't know. And that exactly. also can get in the way of tension. So at the same time, keeping it all in the point of view of one character can give you tension, but at the same time, it can also prevent you from having tension because there's things that if the reader knew that, the like in the case of Bordock, you know, the fact that we know that Bordox is chasing him and he doesn't is what creates the tension. Yeah. It's, it's well, yeah, it's like you said with that, the moving camera angles. Right. Yeah, yeah it's like you're behind him, Bordox, but he doesn't see you there. Yeah. Bordox is haunting him and wants to kill him, makes us scared for Dobby. If, mm -hmm. if, if we were just in Dobby's point of view, there'd be no tension to it. All of a sudden, Bordox would sh show up and shoot at him, and there'd be a little bit of tension in that moment, but the buildup wouldn't be there. Mm hmm. And you can't get that build up without having those multiple point of views. I actually want, wanted to know, uh, just you know, real quick, and we can uh, wrap it up. What is your writing schedule like? Do you set something out before you start? Do you have a, a certain word count that you feel like you have to reach for the day? God, I shouldn't even answer that question right now because I'm, I'm so struggling to get back in a routine. But typically, my best writing time, you know is right now. I should not even be on the phone with you because when I get up in the morning about uh, 9 o'clock, I'm usually, I don't usually don't go to bed till 2 a.m., so mm -hmm. I need my seven hours sleep. So I usually get up about 9, 9.30 in the morning. And between 9 and 11 and 9 and noon is my best creative time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I should be doing all my writing. And editing and all that stuff, I can do that later in the day. So I will usually get up get a little bit of breakfast, put the dogs out, and then, you know, I live alone, so I don't even have to get dressed. I can just sit there and write in my whatever I slept in and write for a couple hours at the desk on my laptop. I would say if I get 2,000 words in a day, I'm a happy man. There are days where I have written three to 5,000 words in a day. Mm -hmm. Usually, the further I get in the novel, the more likely it is that I'm going to have a higher word count. Yeah. Uh, but right up front, I tend to have a shorter word count. But as you're kind of like easing into it. As I'm easing yeah, into it. Yeah. Because, because, now that may change, but see, most of the time I'm not ver I'm not a very outlining person. Now, I have outlined already three chapters of my next book because of the fact that not only is it a sequel that wraps up the trilogy, but because I'm doing this workshop where they demand an outline. Hmm. So having, but, having that I, deadline, too, probably. Well, and I've had to start thinking it through. And part of it is also because... I could not figure out how to get into the novel. And I kept trying it and thinking, man, there's no way I could write this as one novel. Because I was starting in the wrong place. And I was like, holy crap. I finally figured out I need to skip a gap in time like I did between book one and book two. Mm -hmm. If I don't do that, I'll have too much novel. There'll be, I mean, you know, book, book two is already longer than book one. Book two is going to be like 350 to 370 pages, depending on how they format it. I don't know exactly what the final count is yet. If I had written the book three as I originally conceived it, starting exactly where book two ends, mm -hmm. it would have been an 800-page book. Oh. I mean, because there was so much story left. So instead, I'm having to skip in time and start in the middle of that story, so I'm already in the action, which actually is great. For pacing, it helps me. That's what I did with book two. You start in the middle where it's already tense. That's that uh, in media race? Is that what that's called in Latin? Yeah, basically, yeah. Med med media race. You start where people will be like, okay, we don't know what's going on, but because they already know the characters, they're with you. Mm -hmm. And you could kind of introduce the details as you go along, but you you start out with a whole bunch of tension. Just like the Bourne movies, you know? We don't really know who this guy is, but man, he's like running for his life for the first minute. So my point is that, that I tend to be a pantser, 
So uh, until I really get far enough into the story that I can know a, a lot of what's going to happen and have a lot more to work with, I do tend to have a lower word count. Mm -hmm. But I definitely set aside time every day to write. When I, you know, there this weekend I didn't do any writing because I had a reading and a bunch of stuff going on, and I had to catch up on a bunch of chores. So I kind of put it aside. And right now I'm really doing a draft two rather than a draft one. When I'm doing a draft one, I set aside time every day to write. I got to write. There are times when you're going to have to just sit there and think things through and try to figure out what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be those times where you're just staring at the, at the screen. Yeah, I mean, if you yeah. even if you are an outliner, sitting there during your outlining process, your outlining process probably takes you a, a couple weeks mm -hmm. to a month to outline the novel, and there'll be yeah. periods where you're not writing anything because all you're doing is trying to figure out what the next scene's going to be. That's still part of your writing time because you're focused about that project. Yeah. Having the discipline to stay on task, if you're serious about a writing career, is the only way you're going to keep pumping out the volume that you need to. I did it last year and the year before with a great deal of discipline. And now I have a bunch of stuff all coming out. The returning comes out in June, but before that, on April 18th, Space Battles comes out, which mm -hmm. is the anthology I edited, which has a story by Mark, Mike Resnick and Brad Torgerson, a brand new story. It has a brand new Davi Ree story, Oh. Set 20 years after the trilogy I'm writing right now, okay? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And you want to challenge yourself? Try to write a short story in your world without spoiling it, set 20 years later. Yeah, <laughs> before before the entire uh, series right now is finished, even. Yeah, I didn't yeah. even know how this series was going to end, and I'm trying to write that story. My kid's dinosaur joke book is coming out. Oh, and yeah, yeah, you mentioned that last time. and Yeah, the Kids Dinosaur Joke Book is going to be coming out somewhere in May or June. Nice. And in June, I have The Returning coming out. Perfect. In June, I also have a short story that I sold to a magazine coming out a year ago. I sold it. And I have another anthology called Wandering Weeds coming out with one of my comedic sci-fi stories that's going to be coming out anytime too, soon. Nice. Too. And, and, and currently, right now, we have The, uh, the Worker Prince is still... Available pretty much everywhere, and uh, uh, rivalry on a sky course. You're the first of the Davi Ree short stories. Uh, one final thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, tell us about your your show on Twitter, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Chat. Uh, the hashtag is S F F W R T C H T. It's every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, U.S. And we talk for an hour with authors, editors, publishers, and others about the craft and business of science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. Later, those interviews get cleaned up as um, transcripts and become um, posted on the website. And they get cleaned up in interviews on places like Grasping for the Wind every Thursday, once a month on um, SF Signal. And then, as well, I, I do stuff. On, I'm doing a space opera series for um, Ray Gun Revival magazine. Basically, it's... I have guests, I'll just name a few of the guests coming up, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it. We've got Robert J. Sawyer on the 9th of May. Um, we've got, um, in April, we've got um, Linda, Linda Poitevin and Stina Light. Um, and uh, then we've got Aaron Hoffman as well coming up. And uh, you can find all that on the website, bryanthomasschmidt.net uh, slash um, S-F-F-W-R-T-C-H-T. It's taken off and become popular, and I, I get books and requests from all the different major publishers now. So I, I'm really, I'm booking into July already because I'm, you know, way in advance. Wow. So people, so it, it basically, I was like, look, I went to some cons, and I said, my problem is I'm poor, I can't go to a lot of conventions, mm -hmm. but here's all these really cool people that are online that are talented that I want to learn from as I'm a writer to help me develop. How can I take what they do at a panel at a convention and turn it into something that is going to be a benefit to people on a broad basis using technology? And I said, what if I did a Twitter interview? I had a lot of success as a journalist doing interviews with, with celebrities and different people. Mm -hmm. uh, did it for a long time. Decided, well, you know, this would be great, and I'm not going to talk about the usual interview stuff. I'm going to talk more about their craft and let them talk a little bit about their books and where the ideas come from, but everything's going to be framed around you know, how do you write? Uh, the craft and business of writing. Um, and so we, we it, you know, it's family friendly. We don't do a lot of controversial stuff. We deliberately stay away from it. If you want to go somewhere and hear somebody debate their opinions on politics, you're not going to hear it here. Um, it's really to help writers 
and people who are readers that want to be more thoughtful in their reading, learn more about who, you know, who is Robert J. Sawyer, why does he do what he do, how does he do what he do, how did he get his start, where do his ideas come from, and how do they become the books that they are, how, do, how does uh, Flash Forward come about, all mm. those kind of things. That's great. So anyway, that's kind of what the chat is, and I think it's you know it's really been a, a really good experience for me. It, it has helped me make relationships and network with a lot of the big names in the business who have later done blurbs on my book. It's it's really you're just talking to fans and you're talking to a lot of different people, and it's just real conversational, just kind of like the conversation we're having here with your interviews. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's real casual, and we we joke around a lot and have a lot of fun. So it's really been a great experience. That's good. Yeah, I I do have to admit that. Uh, yeah, I I have a lot of fun uh, being on that end of the, of it during the, the the Wednesday nights at nine, and it, it was uh, partly an inspiration for uh, for us getting this this show together was to get information from authors uh, for the two of us who you know have like no authoring experience we just you know write a little bit for fun well that and you know there's other people out there who <clears throat> you know don't have the foggiest idea where to start yeah. what to do they have it in them but so like that's how i started and that's kind of where i'm moving past right now so i don't know how come guillermo never comes to that ben's always oh, there he's <clears throat> I, I think he usually works doesn't he what uh do you even I'm, have twitter guillermo i i have a twitter i never look at it though i'm mostly a facebook idiot Wait, Guillermo, you're 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 actually you actually work for a living? I mean, this is totally blowing everybody's mind about immigration. <laughs> <laughs> All those Puerto Ricans and Latinos that come over here are lazy and criminals. You're actually working? Oh, come no, on! I... <laughs> that no, no, no. It's I we, no. I'm I'm working. I'm working. I'm. Uh... <clears throat> he actually has. Uh, yeah, he, he works in customer service uh, uh, for a a very prominent uh, electrical company. Yeah, so I'm a human punching bag. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, no, I can't resist. But you know, now I feel guilty that that here you here you you're saying that science fiction fantasy writers chat inspired you to do oh, this. Yeah. I wouldn't have made you chase me around to be in an interview for six months if I'd have known you were you know. Going <laughs> <laughs> you made me do your laundry. <laughs> oh, I'm so highly in demand. You know, I'm so yeah. famous now. Uh, before we uh, before we wrap it up. Um, well, first off, there, there's the Worker Prince, and then there's uh, Rivalry on a Sky Course. It's a prequel to the Worker Prince. Yeah, and yep. I like it, it's... Well, not not to give anything away, I, I like that it's it's an origin story, but not for um, but not for a character and or, or uh, anything. It's actually like an origin story for, you know, a, a, a plot device in the, in the books, which it's is like the... It's an origin story for a conflict. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the ironic thing is, when I ended up rewriting the story, it was just before the book came out, and I changed how things went, so I ended up rewriting the book <laughs> to match the story. Oh, really? I wanted to do it differently. I was like, no, this works better. So I had to go back into the book and, and fix it. Oh, wow. Uh, it, you know, it kind of reminded me uh, a little bit, like, in you know, in the Worker Prince, when they kind of mentioned it, it, it kind of reminded me of that whole, uh, you know, Kobayashi Maru thing on Star Trek. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, because because it, it was just kind of alluded to, you know, and then you actually saw it when they did the the newest movie, and you know, same thing happened here. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, and then April eighteenth, we have a uh, uh, what's the name of that anthology that's coming out? It's called Space Battles. Space Battles. It's basically military sci-fi and space opera stories uh, where a battle is pivotal to the plot, mm -hmm. and we've got the headliner is Mike Resnick, and he's working with uh, one of the writers of the Future's winners. Who's kind of, uh, you know, Mike's kind of taken under his wing, named Brad Torgerson. Brad's up for a Nebula this year, and probably going to get nominated for a Hugo. He's a frequent contributor now to Analog, and he's an up-and-coming writer. And then we've got Jean Johnson, who's up for the Philip K. Dick Award, and she's doing a story from her novel series, "Theirs Is Not to Reason Why," which is military sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, and then I've got a another story from the Davi Re universe, the. Um, it's set 20 years later. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, you mentioned that one. That, and then we've also yeah. got a couple of stories by people who are part of this anthology um, that are, there's a series of anthologies. This is number six of the Full Throttle Space Tales sto anthologies from Flying Pen Press, mm -hmm. and there's some people like David Lee Summers who have written a series of stories in several of the anthologies, and so we have a couple of those as well. And then we have some new ones, too, by a lot of really cool people. I've got some first-time uh 
stories from um, Sarah Hendricks, who's my co-host on Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Chat, mm -hmm. and Simon Larder has a great story in there, and we have um, Selena Rourke and some other up-and-coming authors who this is their first published story, so that's kind of a, a really neat thing, too. Nice. And then uh, when, when is the uh, returning uh the returning is the sequel to the work of prince <clears throat> it's book two in the davi reed saga trilogy and that one comes out in june and somewhere in in between or about the same time i have 102 more hilarious dinosaur jokes for kids coming out which is an ebook kids book that i did that's dinosaur jokes nice i am actually quite looking forward to that one so yeah, you can get ready to teach your kid although your kid's not quite old enough to understand the jokes yet but you know not yet no but he'll, he'll like He'll grow into it. Yeah, he'll <laughs> like ruining my Kindle. Out of Guillermo, Guillermo can test him out of the dog, you know. <laughs> hey, the dog actually stopped licking itself and listened to the joke. It's a good joke, all right. <laughs> we'll have to put a we'll have to put a smiley face next to that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one hey. was, was distracted from self mutilation. Okay, good oh boy. And he's back putting tongue to balls. That next one's not good. All right. All right. <laughs> so on that note. <laughs> Brian, it was a lot of fun having you on on our show as our first guest, and uh, I hope you had fun. And uh, well, I wish you well. And it's uh, Brian Thomas Schmidt dot net uh, at Brian Thomas S on Twitter. Uh, anywhere else that we can find you? Uh, you can find me. Um, like I said, I'm a regular columnist every Thursday at graspingforthewind dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, I do interviews for SF Signal. In fact, my interview with Stephen R. Donaldson is posting this very moment. I just saw a tweet about it. Nice. And uh, I also uh, contribute, and am, I've just signed on as business manager for Everyday Publishing. So I'll be working with Ray Gun Revival, Everyday Fiction, Everyday Publishing, all the different properties that they work with as well, and doing some things there. All right. Well, I, I thank you again for uh, for coming on our show. Hey, thank you. Good to be here. Well, that was our interview, like we said, with Brian Thomas Schmidt. And uh, again, he's the author of The Worker Prince, which is available now where books are sold uh, online and in some bookstores, I think, maybe. The ones that are left. Yes, the ones, the, the few bookstores that are left. So uh, before we close out the show, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, we'll do a little bit of recap of what we did this week uh Guillermo, what did you do this week i wrote uh kind of a kind of a working on a silly little story ah and 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 who gave you the uh the idea for this silly little story yeah that that would be yourself sir ah. <laughs> nice I, i'm glad i could help I, I like to be able to collaborate i i like the uh i like the idea we just we you know i i told you one thing you added another i added another so now we have a uh a, a mutant cyborg, uh, mutant cyborg, weir shark from hell. Nice, nice. I look forward to reading that when it's completed. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Oh, and I also, I also wanted to say, um, last week was our very first episode, and it was just you and me, you know, talking to each other like we normally do. Um, there were a few little technical things because I'm, I'm still kind of, sort of new to this whole thing. I. I have a new pair of headphones, and whenever you would talk, I could kind of hear you echoing through my mic in my headphones, and uh, I didn't I didn't catch that when we were recording, but uh, I heard it afterwards. So I apologize for that. It probably won't happen again. And also, whenever I said, um, whenever I was talking about Thomas Pinchon, I always had to stop myself from saying uh, Branson Pinchot, which I believe is Belky from Perfect Strangers. I thought that's who we were talking about. No, no, two different guys. One of them oh. wrote, one of them wrote, um, the crying of lot 49, which is great. I, I love it. It's weird. And the other wrote nothing. I think he's done some narrating though on, on a few, uh, audio books. And of course he was, uh, Belky in perfect strangers. Uh, they, they don't make, uh, they, they don't make shows like that anymore. Mostly because kind of racist, yeah. but, um, yeah. No, no, I'm kidding. It, oh. it... <laughs> which, which, by the way, um, the, the, you know, Brian's Brian's a friend of ours, uh, wh whom we interviewed this episode. He, he's been we've been talking to him before. He was uh, we do a radio show Monday through Thursdays too, and you know he was a guest on there. And 
uh, we joke around with each other a lot on, on like Facebook and Twitter and all that. So uh, there may have been a, 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 a little bit of a slight towards Guillermo and towards his ethnicity in there, but uh, it was all in fun. Right. It's, he's, he's just, it, he, he's, that's, that's how he says hi. And he goes to, uh, to other countries to, uh, you know, for missions. And, uh, you know, he's a good guy. He's very, he's been more places than I have. Um, so he's, you know, he's not, he was just trying to get a rise out of me. He's a good dude though. Yeah. He's, he's good people. And he was, he was gracious enough to be our very first guest on the show, which, which, which I thought was great. And also, um, I wanted to say, um, we recorded that interview over, uh, maybe like two or three days. So we, we really did take up a lot of his writing time and, um, uh, it, there, there may have been some spots where, you know, the interview was a little choppy and that again, is just because I'm still kind of new to this uh, editing thing, so I promise next time it'll be it'll be quicker and and or it'll be easier and better and uh, stronger, faster, better than before. Is that how it goes? Yeah, yeah. But a lot of the times, to be honest, uh, you had to cut out those spots with me interjecting. Uh, F you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just random and, swear words. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> got a problem with. Uh, uh, oh, I, I guess what they call, um, I guess what they call uh, sleep deprivation induced Tourette's. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say like selective Tourette's, but yeah, that works. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, oh, oh but back to the, back to what we were talking about. Uh, this week I finished editing a short story I had written uh, called Theft and Bloodshed. And it was uh, an idea I had where basically I, I had just looked up and learned what sword and sorcery is, you know, the genre of sword and sorcery, because, you know, everybody's been talking about it. And uh, a while ago, I looked it up and I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. I want to write a story like that. And also at the same time, I had been, um, I, I just uh, watched for, you know, maybe what, the millionth time, uh, the movie Dragnet. Wow, oh, very with, good movie. Um, uh, Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. And so I was like, hey, let's do Sword and Sorcery as Dragnet. So that was my story, Theft and Bloodshed. I, I edited it, and I submitted it to a magazine. So we'll, we'll see if, uh, you know, later on, if, you know, I, I have a, if I have an announcement to make that I have had something published. Oh, okay. Uh, we all look forward to that. Uh, also, I look forward to you sending me a copy of that, because that would be awesome. I, have, I think I have the first draft of it. Oh yeah! Oh, I made a lot of changes. I, I made some. I changed the character's name uh, because originally it was John, because I just wanted to go something dragnetty. But then you know it, it was it was a little too anachronistic, and uh, I changed the fight scenes. I tightened them up, made them a little. Actually, made the fight scenes a little choppier too, just to make them, you know, more actiony. And uh, so that's what I did this week. And yeah, I can't uh, can't put in a lot of. Uh... Can't put in a lot of metaphors in fight scenes. No, no, that's 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 usually frowned upon. Similes too. Yeah, yeah. Similes, metaphors, just don't use them in fight scenes, I guess. Uh, so, again, that's our episode for this week. It was uh, with Brian Thomas Schmidt, uh, and check him out, BrianThomasSchmidt.net. That's Brian with a Y, uh, and Schmidt is spelled S-C-H-M-I-D-T. Uh, also follow him on Twitter at Brian Thomas S. And also at S-F-F-W-R-T-C-H-T. That's the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writer Chat, which happens every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. So uh, we'll see you next week. We'll, we'll have a, a bit of a shorter episode, and we'll be talking with Brian for the next three episodes about um, a lot of topics. We actually, next topic is going to be on something um okay moral ambiguity pro or con no i don't know uh, it'll come to me okay um, oh wait uh, maybe... t t talk amongst yourselves okay i have a topic um how do you feel about oh, inspiration the... okay there we go okay there we go <laughs> we'll be talking about inspiration next week so uh stay tuned for that if you're having trouble being inspired or what to do with your inspirations when you have them Tune in next week and we'll help you sort those out. So until then, uh, I'm I'm Ben Love. And I am Guillermo Velez. So we'll see you next week. Right. <laughs>